So, my name is Grant, and uh, I'm a technical consultant for a information assurance company in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm not there. I'm not here on their behalf or anything like that. They haven't asked me to be here. Um, this is just uh, something that I enjoy doing in my own time. So, they won't be getting any advertisement from me. Um, I'm also an amateur radio operator, um, which a lot of people think is, uh, you know, an old guy sitting in a shack talking to another old guy in a shack few miles away, and I can see where you get that idea from, but there is a bit of that. But um, the, the main goal of amateur radio as a hobby is electronics and experimentation, just using radios, um, which again is where I got a lot of my, uh, my knowledge from for this talk. Um, I have a Twitter there if you want to follow me. I don't do a lot on it, but go ahead. Um, YouTube, because of course I do YouTube, because any excuse to not do a real job. Um, and the key point there is my email address. If you have any questions you want to contact me, that's the best way to uh, to get me. Uh, and these details will be up at the end anyway, so we're going to get them. So starting off, um, I just want to talk briefly, what is RF? Now, there's a quick show of hands. Who here has hacked RF before? Okay, yeah, more than what I was expecting. Cool. Um, so who here has hacked Wi-Fi? <laughs> Everyone. Okay. If you put your hand up for Wi-Fi, you should have put your hand up for RF. They're the same thing. Any wireless communication is RF. So that's Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, RFID, all that. If it communicates wirelessly, it is radio frequency. Um, now, I'm not saying this to say, okay, yes, that's just a new thing that you can call Wi-Fi whenever you're attacking it, just to make it sound cooler. I am specifically omitting um, Wi-Fi from this talk because you could go into any cybersecurity conference around the world and there'll be someone up here talking about how to break Wi-Fi, so I'm specifically avoiding that topic. Um, so whenever you think of it as RF, whenever you start thinking of it instead of just Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever, whenever you start thinking of it as, as RF communications, there are a lot of tools out there that can make your life a lot easier. Now, I know I said I was admitting Wi-Fi, and some of you might recognize that bottom one. Yeah, I know, but the one on the top, uh, it'll be your right, is an SDR, a software defined radio. They're very cheap, they're about 20 quid or so, they're not expensive, and they allow you to listen to the airwaves. That gives you the ability to look and see what's going on around you. The pineapple's up there because that is all it is. It is an SDR but it has some programming and other hardware in there to make it more suited to Wi-Fi. But at its core, it's software-defined radio. With the SDRs, a lot of attackers will use them for information gathering because they're cheap, they're throwaway, and they don't need a sophisticated pen testing device like the Hack RF1, which is about 200 quid. Um, the cheap SDRs only allow you to listen. They don't allow you to listen and transmit. The uh, dearer ones, the Hack RF1, for example, allows you to transmit as well, which is useful for the likes of us who want to try and break things in a legal way. But for an actual attacker who wants to, um, I don't know, unlock your car or, or do whatever, um, that's too expensive. They're going to use an SDR and build a small kit using an Arduino or some device thereof. They're very easily built. Now, a lot of these attacks have relationships to cybersecurity attacks. So in this case, replay and repeater attacks, basically man-in-the-middle attacks. And in some cases, quite literally, there is a guy standing in between you and the device that you want to get with an SDR lifting all of the communications. So a replay attack is as it sounds. You capture a signal and you replay it at a later date. And there's a surprising amount of uh, equipment, particularly industrial equipment, that is vulnerable to this type of attack, more so than what you might imagine. A lot of cranes now have um, remote control devices that operate in 433 megahertz, which I'm sure probably means nothing to you, but it's a very common band, and it's very cheap to get um, transmitters and receivers for. And there was a company who took the transmitters and receivers out of a crane and attached it to a Lego set to demonstrate that even though the remote controls were sitting over there, that they could sit on their laptop with a uh, SDR transmitter and be able to move that crane. And all they've done is they've sat and pressed on the remote, pressed up with an SDR sitting there, 
and captured that signal and saved it. They've pressed down, they've captured that signal, and they've just labeled the file. They've labeled, okay, that file means up, that file means down. That's it. They then went to the company um, who manufactures these and says, look, we were able to do this. Here's our notes. And the company did a great thing, as all companies do. They said, oh, no, that can't be done. Our stuff's encrypted. And you're like, okay. And this brings me on to a very key point with RF communications. And whenever you think of them like this, encryption does not help you. If it is doing a single command and it is sending a code, even if that code's encrypted, you don't need to know. Because the, trans the receiver, the device in the crane, it knows how to decrypt it. All you're doing is taking that signal and passing it on at a later date. It's a very easy attack. And there are mitigations to help it. Ideally, a rolling code, so making sure that it's not the uh, same code that you're sending each time. But with all great um, defenses, someone's worked out a way around it, and I'll talk about that in a bit. A repeater attack. Again, it's as it sounds. It's like a Wi-Fi um, access point in your house that takes your Wi-Fi signal, boosts it, and transmits it again. It's exactly the same, and there's no defense against this. There are companies that will tell you there is. There's not, because you are not actually tricking the device. Um, I've got another slide on it, which shows it in a lot better detail later on. But whenever you take the signal and you transmit it on, the receiver is looking for a signal. It is not looking for the device, which is something people seem to uh, deviate from. They think, oh, it's tricking it because the key's not really there, say, to unlock your car. It doesn't matter. The car doesn't care whether the key's there. It's looking for a signal. The key could be 10 miles away. As long as it's getting the signal that it's expecting, it'll open. So in my mind, it's not really a trick. It's showing the car what it wants. It's a fluke of the, the technology. So I said in the, uh, the replay attacks that there's a way around it with a rolling code. Now, this device here is called a roll jam. It was made by a very intelligent guy who I cannot remember his name. Um, and he came up with this. And this helps defeat rolling codes. So in your car, and car keys are a common use of rolling codes. Whenever you press the um, unlock button, it'll send a signal to the car. And it'll be, for sake of argument, 001. Car sees that, signal goes, cool, that's what I want to see, crosses off the list, moves on. You press the key fob again, it goes, okay, sends 002. And it keeps changing through a predefined list of uh, codes. Simple enough. And that will defeat most common replay attacks of just capturing the signal and sending it on. But what you can do here, a car and most um, common types of receivers have a wide receive window. They have a wide window on the frequency that they look at. Now, they have to do this because of varying things, but uh, the common one is manufacturing um, deviations. So if you have, again, we'll stick with the car, you have a manufacturer that prints out, or prints, well, they might print them out these days, who knows. They manufacture three keys, and they're all meant to transmit the same frequency for the same car. Because of variations in the manufacturing process and um, other deviations, they will all transmit on very slightly different frequencies, either side of what they're expecting. And over time, the uh, components will break down, become old, and so that will also cause frequency drift. So to mitigate this, cars have a wide window so that your car key doesn't suddenly just stop working on you because it's slightly drifted out of its listen window. Because it does this, we can attack it. Because in the world of radio, generally speaking, the strongest signal wins. I know there's maybe some RF engineers out there who just started twitching when I said that, but as a general rule of thumb, the strongest signal will win. In that case, what you have is you have a device that has two transmitters and a receiver. And whenever it gets a signal in, it throws out a jamming signal somewhere on that um, receive bandwidth. The car has to check that signal. It can't ignore it because it's a stronger signal, so it's what it cares about. Then in the other band, you'll have your other receiver set to the specific frequency of the key fob. So you'll have gotten out your SDR or whatever you're using to look for the specific signal that that, fre or that uh, key fob's coming in on. And you can narrow your transmitter down on that because you're not constrained by mass manufacturing. The frequency is not going to drift that much from one key press to another. So you can narrow right in on it. And in that case, there can be a massive jamming signal beside you, 
And provided it's not bleeding over into your frequency, your receiver doesn't care. You are not jammed. So you send out the jamming signal, and you capture the key fob signal. Now, you might be thinking, that's all well and good, but the car doesn't open. So what do you do? Well, the person's going to press the key fob again, aren't they? They're going to think, why'd that not work? Press it again. Same thing happens again. The jamming signal goes up, and you capture the next signal. Again, we'll say you've captured 001 on the first one. Second signal comes in at 002. What your device then does is it drops the jamming signal and transmits 001. It transmits the old code that you captured, which as far as the car is concerned, is a legitimate code because it hasn't seen it before. And you've got another code in storage that you can use. And that keeps going. For as many times as they keep pressing that button, you will keep cycling through and unlocking the car. As far as the person, the user, victim, whatever you want to call them, is concerned, it only failed to unlock once. Which, I mean, let's face it, how many times have you done that? You press the button loads of times, you're going right up beside it, hitting it. That's not doing anything. No one would bat an eye. It's a very easy um, way of getting around it. But as soon as you're ready, you can just go up and you can lift the device because it's going to be a cheap device. I think I taught it up. You can make one for about £4-ish, if you're that way inclined. And you just stick it somewhere near the car. So in the um, wee large or somewhere like that, you can duct tape it in there, have it sitting. And whenever you're ready, you can come, lift the device, hit a button, and the car unlocks and you're away. There's very little you can do about that. There are some companies that are working on ways of fixing that. I have not seen a fix yet. So hopefully this works. This is an example of a replay. Sorry, a repeater attack, which I'm sure some of you might have seen. Guy there is going um, up to the house with a receiver. And the other guy is standing close to the car with a transmitter. And all this is is a very simple receive and transmitter system with a directional antenna. So he's standing there, and he will wave that in front of the house and the door in and around that area until he gets a signal. His mate, as you'll see, will stand next to the car with the transmitter. And as far as the car is concerned, it's seeing the signal that it needs. And this car in particular, which I believe is a Mercedes, so you'd be very sore to lose it, is keyless start, keyless entry. So not only could they unlock the car, they could start it and drive off. Didn't need the keys. Now, West Midlands Police, yes, it's them. God bless them, they did try and give a bit of advice in this. They said, the only way to stop this is by putting your car keys in a metal container. I mean, they tried. Um, strictly speaking, they're not completely wrong, they're just slightly wrong. The, up, uh, the frequency that these use is usually um, UHF. Some of them, um, Tesla in particular, also has a two-factor authentication, which uses low frequency and high frequency, or well, low frequency and UHF. But again, a two-way communication, it just means you have to have two receivers and transmitters on each end, and you still get in. With UHF, the more things you can put in its way, the better, essentially. So just putting it in a wee metal container and putting it beside your door, they're still going to get it easily, still well within range. Your best bet, if you must have a keyless start, keyless entry car, which I would not recommend, is either one, turn it off, or put it upstairs. Have it up um, on the second floor of your house that way. For one, it will take them longer because they'll be scanning back and forward on the ground floor trying to find it. And if they do want to start scanning up, if they think you've maybe got it on the second floor, it's then got another wall and floor to get through to get the signal. So if you keep it far away from things, you can uh, help mitigate this. But again, I just wouldn't have a keyless start in the car because once it starts, you're not stopping it. Nope, we've seen that. There we go. Okay, jamming, which is a denial of service attack. Similar to the uh, roll jam, it is technically a replay and jamming device rolled into one. I did want to bring an actual jamming device with me here today to show you. However, jamming devices are illegal. And I have permission to, from Ofcom, the Office of Communication, to do um, experiments with jamming devices under very strict criteria. So I messaged them, I sent them an email, and said, look, I'm doing a talk. I would really like to bring a jamming device with me to show them, you know, how easy they are to build, and not to educate you how to build jamming devices, but you know, 
um, show how, e how easy they are to build and, and the, the makeup of them. And they replied fairly quickly saying, yeah, okay, well, that, that shouldn't be a problem. We just need to make sure that you have you know, low power levels and you don't leave it on for very long. Where's the talk? And I said, oh, that's cool. That's brilliant. It's in London. And they replied almost instantly, which is never a good thing. They replied almost instantly and just went, no, you're not bringing a jamming device into the middle of London. I, okay, cheers, guys. So what I'd done was I set up my SDR in the house, Software Defined Radio. This is the sort of, uh, there are many different bits of software for um, looking at the spectrum, but this is the one that I use. This is generally how they look. And I recorded my jamming device. Now, bear with, it's terrifying to look at. That's it. That, that is it. That is what a jamming signal looks like. A signal strong enough to overpower the signal that you're targeting. Now, that is very low power because to stay within my licensing rights, I have to have low power. And I can't show a high power one because this is being recorded and someone from Ofcom might see it. So, <laughs> this is a low power one. <laughs> and... Surprisingly, I mean, that is probably less than 300 milliwatts-ish. It's very low power. But that, if I put that in between me and my car, it will stop me unlocking my car. All it is is a signal that is enough to interrupt the signal that you're wanting to send. So it doesn't need to be overpowering. It just needs to get in its way enough. Um, now, as I said, jamming devices are illegal, and they're illegal for a very good reason, because they're indiscriminate. You have a lot of people who say that jamming devices are illegal because the man wants to keep a track of you. These people obviously don't understand how they work because if someone was wanting to track you and you turned on a jamming device, I'd be able to see you very, very quickly. You would be lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, it's, no, they are illegal because they're indiscriminate. So you jam one signal, you don't know what else you're jamming. Also with um, homemade ones like this one, you will see my amazing construction You'll see that there's bleed on other frequencies. That's because it was poorly made. I have wires that are not properly insulated running from the um, Arduino, which I used to make it, and to the, the transmitting device. All an antenna is, is a wire. So all of those wires effectively become um, small antennas, which is how you get the bleed over on these other frequencies. So people making a poorly constructed jamming device, even if they are intending to only block this one signal so it's okay, I won't be interfering with everyone else. They could be. The signal could be bleeding over into another part, and you don't know what it could be interfering with. All right, this will keep playing, but we don't need to see that because that's all it is. Oh, by the way, that is a Hello World program. That is what is sending there. Yeah. So how do you actually relate this to cybersecurity, and why should any of you actually listen to me anymore and care? Well. For the personal side of things, the rise of IoT devices, and cheap IoT devices specifically, um, Raspberry Pi projects that people make and home automation that they do DIY style, they're pulling libraries off the internet to do this stuff. And even though these libraries might be encrypted, again, as I said earlier, depending on what you're doing with that signal, encryption doesn't help you. I can still capture it and send it on. Contactless cards, this is a... This is a I mean, you're borderline in the RFID. RFID is still radio communication, but I'm trying to avoid common um, methods of attack. But with that one in particular, you don't even need to build something for that. If you go to PayPal and ask them for a contactless card reader, they will happily send you one. And you can just set that to whatever you want. And if you've been to the subway here in London, you're very close to people. You have one of them in your hand, you start swiping back pockets, you can lift a lot of money very quickly. That's RF. It's just you're getting a product, product that was already built for that purpose. Um, the RF ring entry, it was actually a bracelet. There was a guy, I believe he was American, who set up some home automation in his house and put a bracelet on that just constantly sent out a small wireless signal on, I believe it was 2.4 gigahertz, and it unlocked his front door. So whenever he got close to, yeah, whenever he got close to his door, it unlocked for him. So he could open it and away in. Happy days. I believe he was at least had a couple of brain cells because he had a switch on the inside that he could use to turn it off and lock the door whenever he was in the house. So, I mean, well done, you tried. But I think he had this for about a year before people, or someone, twigged on to what he was doing. Maybe someone who had an SDR kicking about and noticed every time he walked past they got a signal, and they're wondering what was so radiant about him. And they realized what he was doing, 
and it leaked somewhere. Someone else got a hold of it. And someone came with the signal, unlocked his door, and emptied his house. And they're even kind enough to lock the door behind them with a different signal. So it's the DIY aspect. He was very shocked by this because, again, he was like, oh, but it's encrypted. Doesn't help you. The fun stuff in business, RFID security tags. So I'm talking about the ones that you would use to get into your office. If you just have an RFID security tag that you swipe in and go in, there's no keypad, that can be captured. You can put a device near it. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, you can put a device near that captures it because those cards don't change. The signal stays the same or the, uh, the code that they transmit is the same. So if you don't have two-factor authentication, i.e. card key code, someone could lift that and it's very easy to print a new card and bugger off and they've got access. Drones, drones are a fun one. There was an explosion of companies and businesses getting drones a while ago whenever they started becoming cheap. Like funeral directors buying up drones because they thought they were cool and thought, oh, we can have it carry the casket or something. I don't know. I think now they found their place. Um, a lot of architectural and building work use it for getting photos and, and look at some places that would usually be a hard thing to get. Drones are also susceptible to replay attacks, although they are a bit more difficult to do. Technically speaking, they're also um, vulnerable to jamming attacks, but a lot of high-end drones have um, the system in place that if they lose the signal or start getting a signal they aren't familiar with, they will either stop or land. So, I mean, yeah, you could stop someone flying about and wait till the battery dies or something, but jamming attacks generally don't do much other than annoyance. But that's denial of service, really. It's annoyance, isn't it? But with replay attacks, you need a larger sample set. So you could sit with an SDR and you could watch someone fly in their drone and you could capture all their signals. And all you're looking for is that whenever the drone goes up and you see a signal, you can associate that signal with up. That's all you need to do. And you can gain control of it. Now, the uh, granularity comes in because of the uh, joystick that they use to fly drones. They could be up and slightly to the left or up and slightly to the right or you know, vice versa. Because of that, you need to get a large sample set. You need to be there for a while and get a lot of files so that you know for certain whenever you press up on the signal that you've captured and labeled up, that it actually does go up and it doesn't start flying off to the side. This is where jammers can come in because the, oh, sorry, that was probably loud, um, because the GPS devices in them are usually hard to remove for the specific purpose of being difficult to steal so they can't just get it and rip the um, GPS out of it. So what people have started doing, they've been getting these sample sets of uh, communications, flying the drone over to somewhere where they've got someone set up with a jamming device for GPS. The drone flies into that, the GPS signal is lost, and they just keep the GPS with the drone, or the GPS jammer, with the drone until they get it to a workbench where they can strip it down and remove the GPS. They've got it. They've got a what, 300 pound drone or thereabouts laughing. Uh, they can also do it for just destruction. Um, industrial sabotage is a big theme with this stuff because a lot of the industrial kit is large. So in some cases, they may just do it to crash the device. Security cameras. Only wireless security cameras, I'm not talking about the wired ones, but I have seen far too many companies that don't have hardwired security cameras. The wireless security cameras operate on 2.4 gigahertz, which some of you may know is the Wi-Fi range. Again, I'm not going to talk about Wi-Fi, but that's the range they work in. Intercepting that, so trying to do a replay attack, doesn't really work. There's no commands being sent, it's just data, it's uh, you know video feeds. But what it is susceptible to is a jamming attack. So if you have a business that you want to rob for whatever reason, and you know that they have wireless security cameras, you have a jamming device that blocks out 2.4 gigahertz, you turn that on, their cameras will not work. Now, it's not like you've seen in the films where it's a shot of a hallway, a guy walks into the hallway, turns the device on, and he disappears, but the hallway's still there. No, it's bollocks. It's not camouflage. It doesn't make you predator. Okay? If you've noticed on your digital TV, whenever you get a storm or something and signal gets interrupted and it's um, like those black squares and it gets juddery, that's what happens. You're just interfering with the signal to the point where it's possibly not useful. And so this person could come in, do what they want, and anywhere they go within range of these security cameras, the signal will be corrupted. Now, it's not foolproof. They could still get enough data to get a picture or get an image of someone, but it does make life a lot more difficult. Remote industrial equipment I talked about um, in the earlier slide. The only other one that I want to talk about is a JCB. 
those of you who don't know JCB or any Americans here, JCB is a digger. A big, hefty bit of industrial equipment. And someone, I don't know who, decided it would be a good idea to put remote controls in them so that their workers don't need to actually get into the JCB to drive it around. I don't know who thought that would be a good idea, but someone did. Because of this, using replay attacks, someone captured all of the code that they wanted, left a device in the JCB with a 4G dongle, and they sat in their bedroom and they drove this JCB around a car park. Now, these attacks had said industrial sabotage. That's a, a prime candidate for these. Also, I'm not going to... I tried to think of another way of saying terrorist attacks because we're all bored to death with them and all the media is talking about them. But it is an, it is an option. They can get control of some very heavy equipment and just drive a JCB down Main Street. It's very easy to do and it can be very destructive to infrastructure and people who gets in the way. Now, this is a fun one. I did want to do a live demo at this point. However, bringing all my equipment over here by an EasyJet flight, I didn't really want to have a conversation with the security guy about what all this RF hacking equipment is and why I'm bringing it on a plane. I wanted to do avoid that. So um, I, I put this in. Now, this could be a talk in of itself, but I want to talk about it briefly because it terrifies me to the core. For anyone who doesn't know, Biohacking is the practice of implanting electronics in your body for whatever reason. Um, it started off with people putting magnets in their fingers so that they could feel magnetism and feel magnetic waves. Again, I don't know why you would want to do this, but people did. With the rise of small electronics and uh, YouTube, I guess, people have started doing this more prolifically with RF communication devices to make RFID readers and... Um, other wireless communication devices. There was a guy, it was a BBC documentary, I think. Um, there was a guy who had this in his, uh, implanted in the back of his hand, much like these guys, except they're lit up for some reason, where he could use this to unlock his bike and start his motorbike. It's terrifying. Now, electronics in your body are not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. Pacemakers um, are very common. Uh, robotic arms are also becoming a lot more common. And I thought that this is an issue that should be at least looked at in some point. Because you would like to think that the professional side of implants, um, so like the pacemakers that are done by the hospitals, you would like to think that they would have security. Probably not. Um, I think a lot of people would be out of a job if companies did what they should. But there you are. Now with these devices and with the implants, it's the DIY part I'm worried about because people are putting these devices into their body to make life easier for whatever reason. And they're making their bodies hackable. Now, I know that sounds very dystopian and like something you would see in a film, but it is the case. They are putting wireless communication inside their body. Now, for the most part, um, at least at the minute, this is RFID so that they can swipe in and swipe out. There's no real direct communication with their body. But I think the possibility is there as bionics and robotics advance. People are going to start doing DIY things because that's what people want to do. They want to try things themselves. And I think it's going to get to the point where potentially you could have a hacker who could kill someone. Now, I know you're thinking, I was just talking a minute ago about people driving JCBs down Main Street. Would that not kill people? Yes, yes. That is, that is an option of where a hacker could kill someone. But in my mind, this would be more targeted. It's, say for sake of argument, a pacemaker that is potentially vulnerable to an RF attack. Someone could actively stop that pacemaker or make it go haywire if the correct securities are not in place. It's a targeted attack. It's not indiscriminate. It's not like driving a JCB down Main Street because you find a script online and you wanted to try it out. It's targeted. It's you want that person dead. Um, so I think biohacking, again, this could be a talk in of itself, but I, I think that's something that will become more of an issue in the future. And, well, hopefully I'm long dead before it becomes an issue because I don't want to deal with it. And that's it. Any questions? D uh, either of you? Say again?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is that is a way around it. Um, but again, if you have, it depends on on what way you mean timing. A lot of them don't do real time, so they don't do. I sent this signal at this time. Um, they could do. There isn't any reason, but it's probably down to cost. It's cheaper to not have to keep a real clock. Um, so a lot of them just stick to a a predefined set of codes that they then cycle through. But yes, that that is a way to get around it. Yeah. Not a thing. It just transmits. Yeah. No. Um, I, I think I'd mentioned um, Tesla. Tesla have um, a two-factor authentication. They have a low-frequency signal that goes out from the car to the key, and then that then triggers the key to go. Okay, that's a signal I want to see, and then it it then transmits it. But again, all you need is a transmitter and receiver on both ends because that signal will always be coming out of the car. <laughs> Uh, it's fun stuff. Anyone else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's a fun one. I had I had many fun conversations about that drone thing in Gatwick. Yes, they could have got got rid of that, but the problem is they brought in the army to do it, and they just didn't have the kit to do that types of things. If they had the kit, yes, they could have took control of that drone potentially and landed it, but they just they just don't have the kit to do it, so yeah. Um, as, as far as how close you need to be, it depends. Um, you can get a directional antenna, um, which um, a good example is if you've ever seen the ones on top of your house, the sort of wee ones with the wee spines coming out of it, that's a, a Yagi antenna, which is directional. And if you have one of them, if you aim it at either the drone or the person, probably the person is easier because they're standing still, um, you could be quite far away and still pick up that signal. Huh? <laughs> that's another talk. Um, that's an, yeah, no. Um, that's a lot. Speak to me after. I'll happily bore you with that. <laughs> yeah. To make the a repeater device, how much does it cost? Uh, uh, I think from Amazon, not that I bought or built one, um, you can get enough parts to build about 10 for about 10 quid. Um, that usually the, the, the parts are that cheap that you buy them in bulk. You get like a box of 10 uh, repeaters or uh, receivers and transmitters, and it's just an Arduino, or if you're wanting to do something a bit more complicated, uh, a Raspberry Pi would work as well. Yeah, they're, they're not expensive. Yeah, you can listen. Listening is, yep, yep, yep. That's it. They're they're only um, worried about people transmitting, and the only reason that they're worried about people transmitting is interference. Someone who's transmitting who doesn't know what they're doing, they could block out loads of different signals and cause havoc. And especially if you're near an airport, that could be very very bad. So you can listen. Fine. An SDR is perfectly fine to buy and have a listen. Oh, so for like um, smart cars, do you mean that sort of communication? Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen enough about their the, the smart cars communication going back and forward. Um, it depends what you want to do because the replay and repeater attacks only work generally with commands. So um, with a smart car, if it's say driving and it has um, a signal that a car in front of it is slowing down really quickly. It doesn't get sent a signal over wireless to stop. That's in um, the computer of the car itself. So the only signal that that car would actually be receiving would be there's something coming really quickly. You need to do something about it. Um, if they were sending commands that way, then yeah, you could you could get in with a replay attack or jam them. Yeah, jamming them is is also um, a, a possibility with them. Um, you can any any wireless communication, regardless, you can jam it. As, as a rule of thumb, if you can get more power than it, you can jam it. doesn't matter what it is. Yeah? <laughs> uh, 
uh, to broadcast on certain frequencies, it depends what you're doing. To be honest, if you want to um, transmit and broadcast and do experimenty things, I'd get your amateur radio license. The foundation one is very easy to get, and it's a simple exam uh, that you sit. It's just like, what do you do to not interfere with people? That's, that's basically what you need to remember. And then that'll give you near enough all of the bands to allow you to transmit. Um, you could email them and ask for permission for a very specific frequency, and they might, but they might not. Yeah, totally. Yeah, completely. Yeah, you could you could set up a device in there and have it uh, relay to a device wherever you want. Um, in some cases, you could even have it connect to say a four uh, G dongle and have it go to an SQL or not an SQL. Yes, an SQL server for you, and just dump the data up there somewhere, and you can access it wherever you want. It's, yeah, if you can get it nearby, uh, you can lift anything you want. Yep. Yep. So, thank you very much, guys. There is one more question. I was going to say that the next oh, okay. one is going to be the last one. So, please do. Yeah. Yeah, I... It depends. I am currently looking into that to see if there is a way, um, because if you have a directional antenna, you do get quite a lot of gain on it, so you can point it at it, but you're still somewhat limited by how much power the actual device is putting out. So a good antenna to receive is only going to help you so much. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm in the midst at the minute to see if there is a way of sitting on a rooftop somewhere and just scanning the street and lifting RFID codes. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, is that it? Okay, thanks.